I just had this horrible, morbid feeling. It was the massive hit. Virtually collapsed. Jimmy Barnes didn't see coming. I said to Jane, I don't think I'm going to make it this time. He said, I think I'm going to die. I thought, I thought it was gone. On 60 Minutes. You know, I didn't want to cancel. It's against your religion to cancel. I don't want to let people down. From screaming out songs. How sick were you on stage that night? I don't know how I got through it. To screaming in pain. What is the prognosis if untreated? Oh, it's it's fatal. How this rock legend wow. dodged death. I'm coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Australian rock icon Jimmy Barnes has lived his life fast and hard. He's done plenty of things that haven't been conducive to longevity. But that's not the reason he's so thankful and lucky to be alive today. Late last year, he was struck down with an infection in his blood that then spread to his heart. Doctors said he was so close to death, emergency open heart surgery was his only option. It was touch and go for a while, and there was more screaming in pain than screaming out hits. But as Nine's Sylvia Jeffries reports, Jimmy is now out of danger and can't wait to get back on stage. This really is heaven down it's here, a good isn't, spot, it? isn't it? Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, you know, as soon as we seen it, we knew we were going to live here. In the southern highlands of New South Wales, Jimmy Barnes' tranquil country property has long been the perfect antidote to a full-throttle life on the road. What do you see in the river? There, there's geese and there's ducks. But it's, it's sort of gentle and it's rolling. But sometimes... It's a sanctuary that since Christmas has also been a place of healing as he recovers from open heart surgery. Would you show me your uh, new battle scar? My battle scar, it's good. Mm. Wow. Yeah, it's a big cut. That's a big cut. They literally jack you open with like, it's like a, a medieval looking car jack. And it's sort of a reminder of, no, a reminder of what you've been through and a reminder of your own sort of mortality, really. Mm. <laughs> it's not the first time Barnsley's been reminded of his mortality. Back in the 70s and 80s, the hard-living rocker routinely punished his body beyond its limits by consuming stupid amounts of alcohol and drugs. Got your first just the other day. But now at 67 and having been clean, sober and healthy for several years, this latest run-in with death has easily been the most frightening for Jimmy and wife Jane. Were you afraid? At all? Uh, you know what? I, I, there was a point where I was lying and I, and I was just going, I said to Jane, I don't think I'm going to make it this time. He said, I think I'm going to die. Mm. And it's very difficult to hear that from somebody you love suffering like that. And that's a scary sort of thing to contemplate. And I just had this horrible, morbid feeling because I just never felt this sort of sick before. You thought uh, you were Yeah, I thought, it was, I thought it was gone. This was the moment that almost became Jimmy Barnes' final curtain. It was last November and a celebration marking the 50th year of mushroom music. Looking at it now, the agony on Jimmy's face is all too obvious. But back then, there was no way he was going to miss the tribute to his good mate and promoter, the late Michael Godinsky. The show went on, but the truth is Jimmy was so ill that night he barely remembers being on stage. Yeah, I was, I was really bad. And uh, even though I felt like I could hardly walk, uh, I just had to get there and I got out of bed. I remember being backstage and I was sweating, you know, I had a fever. Um, was there pain? There was a lot of pain. My, my back was really sore by this point. You know, I, could, I was struggling to walk. So I, I, mean, I don't know how I got through it. And as soon as I came off, I sort of virtually collapsed. The next morning, Jimmy was scheduled to fly overseas for a gig. But he was so crook, he thought hospital in Sydney was a smarter destination. That decision truly was a thank goodness moment. So I was supposed to be at the airport at six and I think four in the morning I got out of bed and I could, you know, well, I tried to get and, out of bed. And he could have easily said, oh, I'll just sleep on the plane, I'll sleep it off. 
And if he had done that this time, I don't know that he'd be with us. Yeah. So what stopped you from getting on that plane? Well, I got out of bed and, and, and it was, I was in so much pain and so I was wheezing, I was, you know, I had a fever, you know. So, you know, and, so I, and you I, can't go. I, I just can't do it. And in hospital, you know, because I didn't know what was wrong with me. And I knew yeah, I'd had a bad back on and off for years, but this was, this was excruciating. Their dad is no hypochondriac. So when daughter Mahalia and son David heard Jimmy was off to the emergency department, it takes a lot to stop. They from. knew it was serious. And for him to pull the plug yeah. and to be like, I'm going to the hospital is a big deal. I mean, I've been worried about him at many points, but I don't think I've been more worried for him and for all of us, you know, as, as I was, you know, through December. Yeah. But you know, I called, like, I called Jane and she was like, this is not good. He doesn't feel good at all. And so he had gone from feeling like I'm letting people down to something's wrong and I don't know what's happening yeah. with my body. And it was starting to scare him. I think he was scared. I think yeah. he was scared. And he said it was a close, he said, I think I'm dying. And that was yeah. the thing that we're like, what? What condition was Jimmy in when he first arrived here? So yeah, he was sick. Yeah, he was, he was talking and um, uh, putting on a brave face, but we knew that something was brewing. What was brewing was a deadly blood infection, the source of which had to be found urgently. But he was constitutionally very sick. Now I know. The team at St Vincent's Hospital. There was something about him that meant that he wasn't fighting infection properly. Which included cardiologists, neurologists, haematologists and infectious disease experts set about investigating why Barnsley's body wasn't singing like it should. I had these specialists around me and, and they were just really like, working off each other and, and, and they weren't going to let it go until they found it, which was incredible. You know, it's, I'm really, it's the reason I'm alive today. Initially, the experts thought the infection was centred around Jimmy's spine. But after operating on his back, instead of getting better, the patient continued to deteriorate. What became evident was there was still infection somewhere in his body. And so the next place to look was the heart. It was a tense time, but in cardiac surgeon Dr Paul Jantz and his colleagues, there could have been no better help. Eventually, a PET scan revealed endocarditis, a life-threatening inflammation of the heart. The doctors then discovered the infection was attacking a prosthetic valve Jimmy had received 15 years ago. It meant now there was only one option, emergency open heart surgery. With endocarditis, yeah. what is the prognosis if untreated? Oh, it's, it's fatal, yeah. I mean, he, and if he doesn't die of the infection, he would have died from the heart failure, from the whole valve falling apart. Mm. What would that infection have been doing to his heart? Essentially just sort of eating it away. You see an abscess cavity forming around the valve and that would have just grown and grown and grown. Paul, Paul Jans came to see me before the surgery and, um, and they, I said, well, can't you do laparoscopic? He said, no, we have to open you up. And, and, I, and I said, exactly, what are you going to do? And he said, I don't know until we get in. Uh, by the time he got to theatre, which was within a matter of hours, he looked very unwell and he probably had a matter of hours to days, yeah. Wow, that's how close he came. The surgeons always understood the job ahead of them was going to be tricky, but when they saw his heart, they realised his condition was worse than expected. The infection had caused a complication in another one of Jimmy's valves. It was leaking and had to be fixed. Um, this is not a routine operation, it's a, it's a serious one, yeah. And were you concerned for him at that point when you opened up and, and saw how severe that case was? Oh, yeah, I was concerned all the way through, you know, from the minute I met him because they're, they're difficult operations. But what you don't know you're going to get is how much the infection has eaten into the heart tissue. But they put me in the room for, for the surgery, you know, and I know I was going out. I, I thought, well, I wonder, I wonder, you know, if I'll, I'll wake up, you know. I just didn't know if I'd wake up, but, and I didn't see any lights. Nobody was calling me from the other side. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go to the lights. I think, I thought I heard a few voices from down low, but like, hey, you. <laughs> We're ready for you. We're waiting for you. But, uh, yeah, but, uh, he might be able to laugh about it now, but seven hours of surgery took a toll. 
When it was finally over, Jimmy entered a whole new world of hurt. Waking up in, in ICU, you know, that's all really blurry for me. And I remember just being in pain. I remember trying to move and being in pain. Oh, describe the pain. Uh, no, you can't describe the pain. Yeah. Uh, literally, because, you know, if you think about it, you know, this, this, that scar is good. It's like, like you've been ripped in half. It's a, and the, your best friend is a pillow. Mm. You know, you can't, you can't cough. If you cough, it's just agony. You if you breathe too deep, it's agony. Mm. How was he when he came to? The first night, we, you know, we, we, we get worried about bleeding and you're operating on the, the blood vessels that go up to the brain, so you're worried about stroke. And uh, so thankfully he woke up and he looked pretty good the next morning and, yeah, my niece just went up there and made sure he knew the words to K-San, so it was it. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone breathed a sigh yeah, of relief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> but no one was more relieved than Jane Barnes. Waiting rooms outside operating theatres can be lonely places where minds are prone to wander. Jane, did you contemplate life without him? At the last moments of the surgery, I started thinking, oh, my goodness, but mm. you can't think too much about it. It can happen, it can happen any to anybody. Can, anybody can go. Yeah. And like, like when I contemplated dying on, on, you know, before surgery, it, you know, it could have been my time. And I just think you have to save that, savor those moments. And have I told my children that I love them enough? Have I told Jane? You know, that's what you got. You got to do. We'll the, peop go. oh, the people stop. you love, make sure you tell them. <laughs> She's had so much to carry in through oh. all of this. It's been unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, he often says he doesn't know where he'd be without her, but this time yeah. was just next level. Just cut the leaves off and pull the leaves off. Pull the leaves off. Two yeah. months on and back at home in their veggie patch. Tuscan kale. Tuscan kale, yeah. Jane has taken charge of getting her husband better. You just never know, you might need me. <laughs> That's enough, isn't it? Good. Feast. Jane's role is vital and one Jimmy's fans are counting on. Because as you'll see, it includes helping to get this working class man working again. Dance! Dance, little sister! Dance! Jimmy Barnes is a hard man to silence. And my heart rate normally gets up to somewhere around 105 and stays there unless I start singing. And then it starts peaking out soon. So it's good. It's early days, but his recovery is on track. His broken heart is slowly healing, while his voice, well, it's never had any trouble speaking for itself. Guiding Jimmy through his rehab is his wife, Jane. Now, I need you to stop now. <laughs> Ever vigilant, her high-octane husband doesn't overdo it. I, I, but normally I've sing along with the Rolling Stones and they're really loud so I could sing. But Jane heard me from the other house, so which is a bit of a worry, so. <laughs> I can, can still peel the paint off can walls. Hear you. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job, is to peel the paint off the walls. So, <laughs> you know, we can't stop anything. Jimmy might be an impatient patient, Two sets of these. wanting to get better as quickly as he can. I mean, don't curl your spine. Oh, you mean this? Yes. But he knows the reality is recuperation will take months, maybe longer. And to good health. Other parts of his life, though, have returned to normal. All the best. Cheers, everyone. At Sunday lunch with his family. Just thought that was a good toast for good health, considering what we just did. I think so. That's all that matters, really. It's not lost on Jimmy how lucky he is to even be sitting at this table. It's good, good. So it's really, really nice to be here and have them all here and, and be looking forward instead of, you know, panicking. <laughs> yeah. So has this changed you? Uh, I think it's I think it's made me made me stronger. I, you know, I want to be better than I was. I want to be, you know, I've got all this new uh, new life from this that I've been given, and I want to make the best of it. I want every minute to count. From the moment news of Jimmy's surgery was announced, the well wishes flooded in. He's been touched by all the support, 
but it was a call from his friend John Farnham, another legend who's been doing it tough, that really lifted his spirits. And, and John rang me, and I'd been worried to death about John you know, and, and sending messages to him. And John rang me, and, and, he, and I'm sort of like, oh, you know, I think I'm going to be okay. And, and, and he was trying, as John does, he was trying to make jokes to make me, make me laugh and forget about it. And he's going, maybe we should redo the film clip for when something is wrong on my baby in hospital gowns. I'm saying um, overexposure, I think. John, uh, <laughs> I think the nation would disagree. Yeah, but, but, uh, but just uh, things like that, you know, besides, you know, every people that even we haven't seen that. for a while were, were just reaching out to us and it was really, a, 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 it was very special. You couldn't have more support. As they say, the show must go on. But while Jimmy's reluctantly had his feet up, his fans haven't been missing out. 13-year-old granddaughter Ruby has proven the strength of the barn's singing genes, standing in for Jimmy at performances. Mum Mahalia and Uncle David couldn't be prouder. So I said to Ruby, what would you sing? What would you be able to do? And she said, oh, flame trees? Oh, you start at the oh, top. Oh, just take the biggest yeah, song. Take, oh, take that song. Sure. And I'm like, that's her song now, mate. That's yeah. it. You've hand got, it over. You better yeah. hand that one over. But the family aren't getting too big for their boots just yet. There's only one Jimmy Barnes. And they know from experience that reproducing his energy on stage is next to impossible. Does it feel like a second chance for him? I think so. I, think so. I don't know how many more second chances this yeah, guy needs. Seventh chance? That's about seven, uh, he, eight he's got nine, yeah. lives. nine lives. I reckon yeah. he's on the seventh or eighth. Yeah. <laughs> and that's good. And this was sort of part of my rehab coming up here. Because I couldn't wait to get Only out. weeks ago, Jimmy struggled to climb the few stairs up to his rose garden. But once I could run up the hill, We'd sit here, we'd have you know, breakfast or a cup of tea, smell the roses the first thing in the morning. The smell is beautiful. Yeah, it's just gorgeous. But now he bounds up here every day, clipping flowers for Jane. It's a small step in his recovery, but there is a much bigger one just around the corner. Yeah, that's a good little start. When are you getting back on stage? Uh, my first show is, is going to be on the 31st of March at the Blues Fest, which is great. Easter Sunday. Easter the Sunday. The day yeah, of the resurrection. resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got a Jesus complex, but I'm coming back. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, and it'd be great because I miss being on stage, you know. I'm, you, you know, have to. You I have to. to I have to do it. I don't have a choice. I, you know, I need to get up and, and sing. And it's not about you know having people scream and and the door. It's, it's about this. It just clears the emotions out of me. You know. There have been a lot of emotions to work through these past few months. But one stands out more than the others. Jimmy Barnes' near-death experience has been a valuable reminder nothing is more important than a love of life and family. And if I always dream of you, it'll be all Without a doubt, the fact that my family were there and that Jane was there, I wasn't going anywhere. You know, I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to spend, you know, every, every breath I could, you know, spend with Jane. And, uh, and if that meant fighting to live longer, I was going to do it, you know? Mm. Yeah. For Jane. For Jane. <laughs> it's all for Jane. Yeah, that was, yeah, really. We have a good time. Yeah, we're, we're having a good time. Thank you, more than. Thank you, Miss the Army. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it'll be all right. <laughs> Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.